Hello and welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi and I am exposing you to the intellectual side of Christian belief. Today I'm hosting a live discussion between Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Alex Malpass about the Kalam cosmological argument. And instead of debate every aspect of the argument, we decided to narrow in on the second premise that the universe began to exist. The full argument goes basically like this. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, so therefore the universe has a cause. And then in the version of the argument that Dr. Craig gives, he argues that the cause of the universe has properties that are very close to God, spaceless, timeless, non-physical, causeless, powerful, and also personal. If you want to learn more about apologetics, you want to see intelligent conversations between Christians and non-Christians, such as the one that you're about to see today, then make sure to hit the subscribe button on my channel and turn on the little notification bell to all videos. That way you can get notifications and come watch all the cool things that I'm, uh, that I'm hosting and the new videos that we're putting out. So let me go ahead and introduce my guest here. Let me actually pull up my interview scene here. I'm using some new software, so I'm still kind of getting used to everything. So I've got Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Alex Malpass. Let me just give some brief introductions. Dr. William Lane Craig needs very little introduction. I think if you're watching this and you're interested in apologetics, you probably know about him and his work. He has two PhDs, one in philosophy and the other in history. He's debated some of the most popular atheists all over the world. Many regard him as the greatest living Christian apologist. He runs a popular online ministry called Reasonable Faith that receives millions of views every year. No doubt, he may very well be the reason that you tuned in to watch this discussion. Dr. Uh, Dr. Alex Malpass has been on Capturing Christianity actually a few times now. He has a PhD also in philosophy. He's written blog posts and even some peer-reviewed articles criticizing the Kalam cosmological argument in a few different ways. Dr. Malpass, like I said, has been on Capturing Christianity a couple times. The first time we hosted him, he was in conversation with Dr. Luke Barnes on the fine-tuning argument. The second discussion was between him and Dr. Kirk McGregor on the grounding problem for Molinism. So if you'd like to check out those discussions, check the link in the description of the video. I have a link to all of the play, a playlist of all of our past discussions that I've hosted. For the past two or, year, uh, two or so years, I've been hosting discussions like this about once a month. So we do have a backlog of discussions. If you want to go check those out, I've hosted discussions between Dr. Graham Oppie and Dr. Josh Rasmussen, Dr. Graham Oppie and Dr. Ed Fazer, and many, many others. So go check those out. Again, the link is in the description. All right, so let me just lay out some of the, f the, the basic format of how it's going to go today. And we've talked about this, and we decided I think this is going to be, a, we're going to try to stick to this as, as close as we can. So the first hour and a half of the show today is going to be dedicated to discussion between Dr. Alex Malpass and Dr. William Lane Craig. And the last 30 minutes will feature a live Q&A with the audience. So this is going to be a very well attended live event. So if you want to make sure that your question is asked during that last 30 minute period, you may need to send it as a super chat. Going back to the discussion period, the first hour and a half, the uh, the hour and a half time will actually be slit into uh, split into two different sections. So the first section we're going to devote to one argument that Dr. Craig gives in defense of the beginning of the universe. It's a philosophical argument. Both arguments we're looking at are philosophical in nature, and the second half of the show will feature the second argument. And so with that, Dr. Craig, why don't you go ahead and, and take it away? So the first one is an argument against a beginningless past based on the impossibility of an actually infinite number of things. So why don't you take a few minutes, spell out the argument, and then we'll get into discussion. Right. Thank you, Cameron. Good to be with you today and good to meet you too, Alex, for the first time. By way of background, ever since I was a boy, I have been fascinated with the question of the infinitude of the past. I remember lying awake in bed at night, thinking of the temporal regress of events, going back and back and back, every event preceded by another, um, infinitely. And it just seemed to me inconceivable that that could be the case. It seemed to me there had to be a beginning for everything to get started. Well, little did I know that, in fact, this argument had been discussed for literally centuries by some of the greatest minds in Western world history. It goes all the way back to the efforts of 5th century Alexandrian church fathers to refute Aristotle's doctrine of the eternity of the world. And when Islam swept across North Africa, this intellectual tradition was absorbed 
into Islam, where it became extremely sophisticated during uh, medieval Islamic times. It was then passed on to Jewish thinkers in Muslim Spain, who lived side by side with Muslims, uh, and they in turn transmitted the argument back into the Christian Latin West. And the argument has pitted great minds in each tradition against one another. Al-Ghazali versus Ibn Rushd, uh, Sadia ben Gayan versus Moses Maimonides, uh, Thomas Aquinas versus Bonaventura. Uh, the argument came to uh, something of an indecisive halt in Immanuel Kant's thesis concerning his first antinomy uh, about time in his great critique of pure reason in 1781. Kant argued that the um, question of the finitude of the past has decisive, rationally compelling arguments for opposite conclusions, and that therefore it shows the bankruptcy of reason in giving us knowledge of reality. Well, after several centuries of eclipse, this argument has come roaring back into prominence in the late 20th and early 21st century, I think largely as a result of remarkable discoveries in astrophysical cosmology, which point to the past finitude of the universe, thus making people more open um, to the idea that the universe began to exist. And so I've defended two philosophical arguments, as you say, in defense of this premise. The first one is based upon the impossibility of the existence of an actual infinite, and the second is based upon the impossibility of forming an actual infinite by successive addition. Now, the first argument goes basically like this. Um, an actually infinite number of things cannot exist. Second, a beginningless series of events in time is an actual infinite. Three, therefore, a beginningless series of events in time cannot exist. And the crucial premise, I think, in this argument is the first, that an actual infinite cannot exist. Viewers need to understand the difference between an actual infinite and a potential infinite. For most of um, Western world history, the only concept of the infinite that was uh, available was that of a potential infinite. This is the idea of a collection which has a finite number of members, but is always increasing limitlessly, or rather with infinity as a limit. It is increasing endlessly with infinity as a limit. However, in the late 19th century, the German mathematician Georg Cantor developed infinite set theory. He regarded the uh, potential infinite as not the true infinite, rather the true infinite is the idea of an actual infinite in which you have a collection that is not increasing toward infinity as a limit, rather it actually has an infinite number of elements in that collection. And Contour was able to develop a, a whole system of transfinite arithmetic based upon um, this theory. Now, the question is, can an actual infinite exist in reality? Can an actual infinite be instantiated in the real world? Skeptics um, argue that it cannot, and as evidence of this, they will give thought experiments illustrating the sort of absurdities that would result if you could have an actually infinite number of things. One of my favorites is the brainchild of the great German mathematician David Hilbert uh, called Hilbert's Hotel. Hilbert asks us to imagine as a warm-up a hotel with a finite number of rooms. Uh, and he says, suppose furthermore that all the rooms are occupied. If a new guest shows up at the front desk asking for a room, the manager apologizes, sorry, all the rooms are full, and the new guest is turned away. But now, Hilbert says, imagine a hotel with an actually infinite number of rooms. And suppose furthermore that every room is occupied. This needs to be clearly understood. There is a real 
flesh and blood person in every room throughout the Infinite Hotel. Now suppose a new guest shows up at the front desk asking for a room. Of course, says the manager. And he shifts the guest who was in room one into room two. He takes the guest who was in room two and puts him in room three. He takes the guest who was in room three and puts him in room four on out to infinity. As a result of these transpositions, room one now becomes vacant and the new guest gratefully checks in. And yet, before he arrived, all the rooms were already full. In fact, Hilbert says, an infinite number of new guests could show up at the front desk asking for a room. The proprietor says, no problem, no problem. And he shifts the guest who was in room one into room two. The guest who was in room two into room four. The guest who was in room three into room six and so on out to infinity, moving every guest into the room number twice his own. Now, since every number multiplied by two is always an even number, as a result of all these transpositions, the odd-numbered rooms become vacant, and so the infinity of new guests gratefully checks in. And yet, before they arrived, all the rooms were already occupied. I think that Hilbert's Hotel illustrates um, very dramatically that the existence of an actually infinite number of things in reality is metaphysically impossible. Uh, and since there's nothing about a hotel uh, that is special in this case, um, this argument goes to show that you cannot have an actual infinite in reality. All right, so let's pick it up there. Alex, would you like to, uh, yeah, where would you like to begin with this? Okay, so um, thanks for that, Bill. So uh, I guess one place to start is um, at the right start of this, of course, the term actual infinite and the term potential infinite is coined by Aristotle. Um, and Aristotle had a different view to Bill, right? Aristotle thought that the past was infinite and the future was infinite. Um, and he thought that you couldn't have an actually infinite, uh, an actual infinite couldn't exist. Um, uh, but the way he reconciles that is that the past, the infinite past and the infinite future are potentially infinite and not actually infinite. And that's because Aristotle's understanding of an actual infinite is something like this, where the infinite, so a quantity is actually infinite in Aristotle's sense if its, in, if its infinitude is present all at the same time, uh, and an, a quantity is potentially infinite if its infinitude is spread out over time, right? So a line can be potentially infinitely divided in Aristotle's sense, because you can keep dividing it right, over time and keep cutting it in half, cutting it in half, cutting it in half, um, and that, that it, the infinite, infinite divisibility is spread out over time. But there's no one point in time where it's, it's completely divided, right? That division is never, is never finished, right? So that way, he, he thinks that if an infinity is spread out over time, then it's potentially infinite. And then if you come to think about the extent of time, obviously time itself, the infinite past, is never infinite at any one point, right? Its, it's infinitude is, is spread out over time. It is time. So that's, in that sense, you can reconcile those two ideas. So just, just to put a marker in the sand that there are different ways of using these terms, in fact, there are lots of overlapping terms that use similar terminology, uh, similar, use the same words, for instance, actual and potential um, in Aristotelian metaphysics means something slightly different to how they do in this particular um, issue of infinity, right? So it's not necessarily the same thing to say that a potential infinite is to do with potentialities that will become actualized. Um, for instance, a potential infinite can never become an actual infinite. Right, according to Aristotle and, and according to Bill. So it can't be that a potential infinite just means something that could become infinite. Like that's not what the word potential infinite means here. It, it, no. So for the, for the sake of um, our conversation, I'm more than happy to just use, use the terminology the way the Bill does because um, we're really talking about semantic difference here. Um, so for potential infinite is just something that's increasing over time while remaining finite, but approaching infinity is a limit that it never gets to. That's, that's perfectly fine with me. Um, I mean, there's, there's contemporary skepticism about the coherence of the notion of the potential infinite. I mean, you can find lots of uh, philosophy of mathematics literature of people um, expressing um, doubt that there's a coherent notion there. But again, I'll, I'll leave that to one side as well. It's not, that's not important for, for our conversation. Um, 
so let's move on. So then Bill brings up the idea of Hilbert's Hotel. And, you know, there, there are a ton of these examples. Hilbert's Hotel is one of the more famous ones. There's a, a similar example that's often called Craig's Library, which asks you to imagine a, a library which has infinitely many books on its shelves. And then you can construct similar kind of scenarios like that, like the one that builds a union. Check out a book from the infinite library and ask how many books there are left. Well, there's the same number of books left as there was before you checked that book out. Um, but so in that way, what we're doing is generating, um, I guess, absurdities, um, which play around with this um, property that infinite, actually infinite sets have, that we can call Cantor's property, which basically just says that you can, if, if a set or collection is, is infinite, then you can line up proper parts of it with the whole. You can show that proper parts have are equinumerous with, with the whole. So there's just as many even numbers as there are whole numbers, for instance. And so any of these um, absurdities, it seems to me, always play on that property. So anything with that property is problematic and can't be instantiated by anything concrete. We take it that that's Bill's fundamental metaphysical claim here. Um, and while I'm sort of sympathetic with that, I mean, it, it's intuitive, right? I, I think I do also wonder that it's not quite clear to me that there's necessarily a contradiction involved. Um, and there could be. It depends how we draw draw out the um, absurdity. And unless we do bring out a contradiction, it's not quite clear to me if saying that something is absurd is the same as saying that it's impossible. I mean... I kind of feel like absurd, absurd things. Well, absurdity is kind of in the eye of the beholder, right? Like, I mean, quantum mechanics uh, has um, implications that many people would have considered to be absurd prior to their kind of um, empirical confirmation. The superposition, for instance, sounds, seems absurd. Quantum tunneling, right? You know, how can something move through a solid body without, um, without sort of breaking through it like a bullet or something? Um, and yet that sort of thing happens. Um, quantum teleportation, blah, 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 blah. So there are things that you could think of as being absurd, but we've grown to live with their weird consequences. And um, I, I sort of feel like, um, I think some philosophers anyway, there's a decent chunk of philosophers who feel the same way as I do about that, that very well, they may be absurd, these consequences of actually infinite things, but we <clears> would prefer to see slightly more than that for us to feel confident in embracing the same conclusion that Bill does about that. I mean, maybe there are things that I think are absurd that are, that are real, right? So maybe I could embrace an absurd thing, right? And philosopher has to be particularly open-minded um, about, about the strangeness of reality. Uh, and it might be that, that that's the case. So th there one are One of the things of... that comes to mind, real quick, one of the things that comes to mind yeah, is yeah. quantum mechanics, how the superposition, there's a few mm -hmm. different things in quantum mechanics that seem, on the, on the face of it, seem absurd, but... Mm -hmm you know, we, we sort of just accept them because that's what we observe. That's right. So, and I wonder whether maybe if um, a Hilbert, I flew off in a spaceship and found a Hilbert's hotel in some particularly weird part of the universe um, and the, the doorman was particularly amiable and made room for me, even though it was full, that um, <laughs> uh, maybe it's just one of those weird Star Trek episodes and that's what happens in that part of the universe. I don't know. Like, you know, Douglas Adams style view of the the, um, the possibilities inherent in such a large um, place. I mean, I'm not saying that I think that that's there, of course, obviously. I'm just saying that um, strangeness is, is not a reliable guide for impossibility, it seems to me. Not infallible guide to impossibility anyway. Why don't um, we pause there and get Craig's thoughts cool. and then we'll... Because we'll, uh, you, have, you have a bunch of different thoughts and objections to this to this first part so let's get craig's thoughts here and then we'll move on aristotle's position that alex mentioned with regard to the infinitude of the past as a potential infinite was also the position adopted by thomas aquinas in his attempt to resist the arguments of the uh, arabic uh, theologians and philosophers who argued against the infinitude of the past and it seems to me that this is uh, a, a quite hopeless notion. Given a certain theory of time called the tensed theory of time, I think it does make sense to treat the series of events later than any point in time as potentially infinite. 
The number of events will always be finite, but increasing uh, endlessly toward infinity as a limit. But I think it makes no sense at all to treat the past as potentially infinite. In order for the past to be potentially infinite, it would have to be finite, yet growing in the earlier than direction. And that's just completely contrary to the nature of time, which involves temporal succession of one moment after another in the later than direction. So we mustn't confuse the mental regress of counting events beginning in the present and going into the past with the actual real progress of events in time, which would involve, in a case of a beginningless series, um, uh, events without a beginning um, and then growing forward in time. And if we were to ask how many events have transpired up to now, the answer would be an actually infinite number of events. Um, if we were to divide time into hours and say how many hours have elapsed prior to the present hour, the answer would be an actually infinite number of hours. And that is true at every point in the infinite past, at every point in the infinite past, an infinity of events an actual infinity of events has already been instantiated in reality. Whether, whereas if you begin at a point in time and go forward uh, in the later than direction on a tense theory of time, you will have simply a finite number of events and ever more events being added successively. So I'm not persuaded that the Thomistic Aristotelian answer to these arguments is at all uh, plausible. Now, Alex is certainly right that when we appeal to these absurdities, we are not talking about logical contradictions or uh, incoherences. Um, Jose Bernardet, in his book on infinity, says that there's no logical contradiction involved in these monstrosities, but you have only to look at them in their concrete reality to see that this is metaphysically impossible. Uh, and there, you can just multiply these illustrations endlessly. Bernadette gives an example of what we could call Bernadette's book, which is a book um, in which the first page is one inch thick, very thick first page. The second page is a half inch thick. The third page is a quarter inch thick, and so on to infinity, each page being a half the thickness of the prior page. So Bernadette says, let's turn the book over so that the back cover is facing us. Now he says, slowly lift the back cover and ask, what do you see? There's nothing there to see because there is no last page of the book. And if you try to touch that with your finger, he says there will be an invisible barrier preventing your finger from penetrating the pages of the book. Well, now, to me, after a while, these kinds of absurdities just become so massive that it's no longer credible to think that such a thing could really exist. And this is not at all like quantum mechanics. Uh, that depends on your interpretation of quantum mechanics. There are at least 10 different physical interpretations of the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics. And I and many philosophers of science would agree that the Copenhagen interpretation, the sort of traditional uh, interpretation given by Niels Bohr is absurd, but there are plenty of good interpretations of quantum mechanics that are fully deterministic, uh, that don't involve these sorts of bizarre uh, results, um, and therefore I don't think that's a good counterexample. So my strategy is that of Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein, um, in answer to David Hilbert, who said, no one will drive us from the paradise that Cantor has created for us. Wittgenstein says, I wouldn't dream of trying to drive anyone from this paradise. Instead, he said, I do something quite different. I try to show them that it's not a paradise so <laughs> that you'll leave of your own accord. He says, I would say, just look about you. You're welcome to this. And that's the same approach that I would take. Um, 
if you're willing to swallow these sorts of absurdities, okay, I can't, I can't move you from that, but um, I'm going to leave the Cantorian paradise to the realm of the conceptual rather than the realm of the real. Okay, um, I we, <laughs> I'm going to try and not respond to everything that feels to me like I want to respond to. So, I mean, we could keep talking about Aristotle's idea. Um, but but let's put a pin in that because it's not the most directly relevant thing. And I'm quite happy to concede that the quantum mechanics analogy is an analogy only, and it's not um, it's not absurd in the same way as as the proposal that actually infinite um, things would be. Quite happy with that being that they're, they're different. I mean, it's only drawing a passing analogy to illustrate the point. I think um, I'm happy with them being different. Um, and and very let me just very quickly say Benedetti. Uh, it, it is very skilled at bringing out crazy, uh, crazy sounding implications of, of the actual infinite. That's true. That's where we get the Grim Reaper paradox from, for instance, as well as, well as a number of others. Um, but, but Benedetti was a defender of the actual infinite. I mean, that, the book the, that we're talking about, the, the Infinite, an essay in metaphysics, is a, it, you know, it, it's him trying to defend the possibility of the actual infinite. And, um, so yeah, he's, he's a guy who's often wheeled out as someone who's uh, showing you why you shouldn't believe that these things exist. But, you know, he was quite happy with them existing. He has weird, he's willing to uh, expand his uh, horizons beyond what much, many people are, are capable, or comfortable doing in order to try and understand what things would be like if that, if that was real. So he's not really an enemy for, you know, the actual infinite, even though he, he gives the enemies of the actual infinite much of their ammunition. That, that, that's, that's very true. But, but So let's put all of that to one side. It seems to, so what... I was hoping we could talk about a bit was a type of objection, right? Which um, I written a paper with Wes Morriston, which you've read. Um, mm -hmm. Where so let me try and explain out the basic contours of this objection. Right? So this isn't really a direct objection to this argument, Alex. Rather, I should mention yeah. that I've linked, if you guys want to read Alex's paper or co-written paper with Dr. Morrison, check out the link in the description of the video. I've, I put a link there. So if you guys want more, if you, you hear him explain it and you want to read more about it, then you can check for it there. Okay, cool. Thanks. So this objection isn't direct, and a direct objection to the argument that we're looking at right now. Rather, it's, um, as, as Craig said recently in uh, print, that this is um, an ad hominem, and in, in a way it is an ad hominem, right? But it's not an ad hominem in the sense of the fallacy ad hominem, where what you're doing is, is sort of attacking the person instead of the argument, right? What this is, it's an ad hominem in that sort of nuanced philosophical usage of that term, which means drawing attention to um, it, it's sort of conflicts between beliefs held uh, that the person making the argument has and the implications of the argument that they're making. Uh, might have for their beliefs, right? And so this is similar to the way I think Bill uses the the moral argument, right? Because I think um, an atheist uh, could accept that there's no uh, moral values if God doesn't exist and just bite the bullet and say, well, I guess there's no moral values then and be a, a moral nihilist or something. Um, and if so, then the moral argument's not for him, right? But if there was a, an atheist who wanted to say that there are moral values, um, then they have to explain how there are moral values if God doesn't exist, right? And then the moral argument is kind of difficult for them. It's a puzzle that they have to answer. And in that sense, the, it seems to me that the moral argument functions as an ad hominem in that way. It's posing difficulty, but how do you reconcile the moral argument with your belief that there are moral values, right? And here, the, the, that's how my argument is going to work, right? I think Bill's belief is that it's possible that the future has no end to it. I think that's uh, something that he thinks is true. And that might be for theological reasons, it might just be for metaphysical reasons. Um, and I think that the, the argument that we've just been talking about, which says if the past was had no beginning, it would be an actual infinite, can be mirrored into an argument uh, in the future tense. So you're effectively saying if the future has no end to it, then um, there will be an actually infinite number of events, right? So we could we could say we can imagine an angel um, singing a praise to God once a day. Um, and pre presumably, angels are immortal. Um, so if the time has no end to it, the future is never going to end. Uh, you could ask how many praises will the angel sing, right? 
Um, and it seems like it couldn't be any finite number of praises um, if the future has no end to it. It would be just the same as if you said, imagine an angel has been singing for the whole of a beginningless song. You'd say an actually infinite number, and it feels to me like once we switch the tenses around and I ask the same question in the future. Um, are you, are you, Craig, are you hearing some... Uh... Some breaking up here. Yes, that's right. I am Cameron. I'm not getting all of Alex here. Uh, it's breaking up. Okay. Uh, so Alex, you you broke up just for a little bit, but it looks like you might be back. So, so yeah, just uh, repeat okay. the last couple of sentences. So I'm saying, um, if you thought of an angel who had been singing praises to God once a day throughout an infinite past, and you asked how many praises has the angel sung, you would say. And he has sung an actually infinite number of praises. And if we consider an angel who's singing praises throughout an infinite future, um, if we ask how many praises will he sing, we should give the same answer. He will sing an actually infinite number of praises. The only difference is that we've changed tense from the past tense to the future tense. Um, and uh, it seems to me that that change of tense doesn't make any difference to how many praises um, there are. It just changes our perspective on whether they're past or future. Um, but if you think that there can't be an actually infinite number of things like Bill does, then you should think that the future can't be endless, right? That it must come to an end at some point. Um, so this is a question of how do you reconcile the belief that the future, it's possible that the future is endless with this mirroring, right? Temporal mirroring of the argument we were just discussing. Um, and I think Bill's got a couple of symmetry breakers that he proposes which get around this objection or attempt to get around the objection. So let me hand over to Bill. Um, actually, yeah, Cameron, was that clear, do you think, my my argument? Yeah, I think so. And I'm going to give a, a quick summary of it real quick, just to, uh, from, from my perspective, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong. So it sounds like what you're saying is that when we're looking at the past, there's an infinite number of things. The person who wants to say that the past is infinite, there's an infinite series of events that happened. But what you're saying is that just in the same way as there's an infinite number of things in the past, if we think about something that's happening in an endless future, like angels, then we still have an infinite number of things, and it would be an actual infinite if we ask the right question. If we say, how many times will this angel, or how many times will, that's the emphasis I want to put, how many times will this angel s repeat this phrase? And the answer will be, if the future is infinite, and if they are actually singing this every day, then the answer will be, an infinite number of, of things. And so what you and Morrison point out in the paper is that there's got to be some kind of symmetry breaker. And I think that's a technical term that might go over the heads of some of the audience that's that's watching. But a symmetry breaker is where, in Craig's case, when he wants to say with the past, there can't be an infinite series. There can't be an infinite past because of, at least with this first argument, against an actual infinite. If this works against an infinite past, what Alex and... Uh, and Morrison are saying is that it's also going to work against an infinite future. And so you can't have an infinite future or you've got to find some breaker between the situation with the past and the situation with the future. And it doesn't seem like we have that kind of breaker. At least that's what, what Alex and, uh, and Morrison believe and argue in the paper. So I, I think that was, I, I saw you nodding a bunch. So hopefully that was, that was clear <laughs> enough. That was good. Yes. Well, I have a five-point response to this. <laughs> of course you do. The first two responses show problems with the objection itself. The second three provide reformulations of the argument that uh, break the parallelism clearly between past and future. Now, I won't try to talk about all of those now so as not to dominate the conversation. But Alex has already anticipated my first point uh, and raised it for me. Namely, I think that this argument is just an ad hominem objection. Um, it doesn't expose any flaw in the reasoning. It doesn't show any fallacy in the argument for the finitude of the past. Um, all it says is that it applies with equal force to the future. And um, it is aimed, therefore, at only certain people. Yeah. Uh, for example, those who believe in personal immortality, or those who believe in angels, or 
uh, in well, the case of Andrew Loke's formulation, those who believe in God. Can I just pause you there very quickly? I think it's aimed also at people who believe it's possible that the future is endless. It's not that you don't have to think that it actually is or that anyone lives forever, right? Of course, yes. those people do, right? But the more, more contempt, more, um, what am I trying to say? The, the less radical view that even atheists could think uh, it's possible that the future is, is endless, right? It's not just a theological view about the afterlife, right? Uh -huh. so let me just, and I'll yes. Uh, what I would say in that case is that the argument then is question begging, if not ad hominem, namely, uh, it just assumes that an endless future is possible, even though you have an allegedly flawless argument that it's not. Uh, and so I think that the argument is either question begging or it's ad hominem, because it doesn't do anything to expose a flaw in the argument for the finitude of the past. It, it is, as Alex says, merely an indirect, not a direct objection. Um, shall I go on? No, I just think that's, that's you right. Want... right. I agree. All right, now let's, let's talk about the objection itself then. Um, if Alex uh, affirms that if a beginningless series of past events is impossible, then an endless series of future events is impossible, then that, that commits him, I think, to the position that there is no possible world in which the series of events has a beginning but no end. Uh, in other words, he has to say that the view that the series of events in time is potentially infinite is not just false but impossible. And that's a very radical thesis, I think, that would carry a heavy burden of proof. Um, Sorry, can so, you repeat that for me? I, I, I don't think yeah, I was following if, that. If he says, if a beginningless series of events, uh, past events, is impossible, then an endless series of future events is impossible. That entails that there's no possible world in which the series of events has a beginning but no end. Uh, and so that's a pretty radical position. You've got to say that the um, position that the series of events in time beginning, say, at the Big Bang is potentially infinite, is impossible, not just false. And so the objector here has a, a hefty burden of proof to bear, I think. Okay, so that's an interesting re reply. And I think, um, I think, first of all, I'm not sure I have a view on, on that exact question in particular. I, for instance, I, I'm not sure <laughs> that I think the past or future is, is either infinite or finite. I, mean, I'm, I just think it's beyond my ken, for one thing. But uh, what I do think is that the balancing act that the argument's exploiting, I think the consequence would be that the temporally asymmetrical metaphysical views are out and temporally symmetrical metaphysical views are in. So what is also ruled out, which I think Craig, um, Bill would be quite happy with, is you know the idea that all those possible worlds where the past has no beginning but the future has an end, right? They're impossible. You you do think in my view, possible. yes. So so we agree on that, right? And then I think that ones where the past and the future are both infinite, and ones where the past and the future are both finite, they're both possible as far as I can see, broadly possible. Um, but but, but it, where the future is different from the past in its cardinality, if you like, I think though that 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 sort of temporal or asymmetry. I think what my what my impressing you on is that without a symmetry breaker, you can't have those temporally asymmetric views. Well, and my claim is that that is a very radical claim to make. You're you're saying that um, a view like the classical view of the series of events. I mean, this is a very widespread dominant view that the series of events beginning at the first event is potentially infinite, is metaphysically impossible. Um, and so I'm just in, in attempting to increase the burden of proof on the objector here to say he's got a burden of proof to show that this is the case, um, yeah. which is... I, All right, well then, let, let me go on rather than dwell on yeah. that point to say that what the defender of the 
um, argument against the infinitude of the past, who also believes in an endless future, is that he will try to break the parallelism between the past and the future, such that the past series of events can be finite, and yet the series of future events from any point in time can be endless. Um, in other words, the, it doesn't follow from the finitude of the future that the, the future has to come to an end. It can be endless but finite. This is what Georg Cantor referred to as the potential infinite. Cantor called the potential infinite a variable finite. And so uh, I think there is such an asymmetry. Why? Well, because I hold to what's called a tensed theory of time. According to this theory of time, temporal becoming is an objective feature of reality, um, and there are no events later than the present event. So on a tense theory of time, uh, it would entail that there is no actually infinite number of future events. On the contrary, the number of future events is just zero. There are no future events on a tense theory of time because they haven't yet come into being. But the series of events from any arbitrary point in time going in the later than direction will always be potentially infinite. That is to say, it's always finite, but it's increasing toward infinity as a limit. It is potentially infinite. By contrast, as I said, in my response to Aristotle and Thomas, um, for the series of past events to be potentially infinite in the same way, it would have to be growing in the earlier than direction and be at every point finite, which is uh, contrary to the nature of temporal becoming. So I would say that given the possibility uh, of a tensed theory of time, we have an asymmetry between the past and future that allows us to uh, deflect the force of this objection. Perhaps it'd be helpful to get a little bit clearer on your your theory of time, your tensed theory of time. You yes. don't believe that there, you're you're yeah. what's called a presentist. So it's only the... True. The only the the moment that exists right now is the only moment that exists, and so the future is merely potential. The past yes. doesn't exist anymore. What only what exists is the present moment, and so that's why you're saying you can get this sort of symmetry. Now, one one question, one objection that I've seen, and even in your defenders class, some people have brought this up, is that well, if the past is not real, how can you say that there's an infinite number of past events? Mm -hmm. um, because we can count them. They have been instantiated in reality. I've made it clear that when I say that an actual infinite cannot exist, I mean it cannot be instantiated in the real world. And um, clearly past events have been instantiated in the real world. Uh, the medievals would say they have exited from their causes, whereas Future events have not exited from their causes. They have not been instantiated in reality. On a, on a tense theory of time, they are unreal. Mm. Now, to clarify the difference between these competing views of time, on a tenseless theory of time, the future series of events is just as real and existent as the past series of events. And the notion of past, present, and future is purely a subjective feature of human consciousness, um, rather like the here in space. There is no place in space that is objectively here. It is wherever the subjective observer is located. And similarly, on the tenseless theory of time, there is no objective now, uh, just different observers at their respective temporal locations will observe their moment to be now. Um, so these are two contrasting views of time, and I would agree with Alex that if you are a tenseless theorist of time, then there is no symmetry break here between the past and future, and it would imply on a tenseless theory of time that the future will come to an end, just as the past has a beginning. But my claim is that if you have a tensed theory of time, according to which temporal becoming is not subjective, but a real and objective mind-independent feature of reality, um, then it makes perfect sense to say that the past, though endless, 
is finite. Now, I know that this is going to probably upset both of you guys, but we're almost at the point where we've got to transition to the second half of the, the first part of the show so we can move on to the argument from the impossibility of forming a, a, an actual infinite from successive addition. So, Alex, why don't you give a response to this? And then if we can, move on. But, Fair Bill, I know, I know that you might have some things to say. So we'll just see where we can go. Sure, I would. But I'll, Alex may have the last word, of course. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I do. So, I mean, I am increasingly as I've studied that response, I mean, Bill's famous for that response. I increasingly find that to be wrong. Right. I mean, um, with all due respect, I, I disagree very strongly with that because um, so saying that there are no future events um, we have to be very careful to get our tenses correct, right? I'm not making an objection that presupposes the B theory. I'm more than happy to converse in the language of the A theory. Um, very comfortable talking about tenses. I mean, my PhD was in tense logic, for instance. <laughs> that's, yes. that's a language I'm very familiar with. Um, so it's not that I'm making a B theory, B theory objection. It's just that, look, of course, on presentism, there are no future events, right? There are no, like now, present tense. And of course, there also are no past events now, right? There's only the present event. Um, so it, it's not a symmetry breaker there just to appeal to the non-existence of future events if what you mean is not currently existing, because that's true of past events too. They don't currently exist. And Bill said, well, they have existed. And that's the difference. But of course, future events will exist, right? So it feels to me like once you get your tenses in order, um, then we're back to a symmetrical situation again. I mean, tenses are symmetrical by their very nature, right? Everything you can say in the future tense, you can say in the past tense. There's no um, axiom of ten, uh, tense asymmetry or something like right? that. They're, they're symmetrical. So, uh, and look, here's, here's, it seems to me that this is a subtle point, but it's relatively, it was very important for this, right? That I think Bill switches from the future tense to the future perfect tense when he's talking about um, the accumulation of things over time as, as it increases towards infinity as a limit without ever getting there. Um, and I think that when he says that the, um, the, the future is potentially infinite, he's saying the number of events that will have been, which is the future perfect tense, is always finite and increases. Yeah. Um, as, as time passes. And so here's an analogy. I think if you were to imagine, say, putting a marble into a jar every day that goes past, right? Once a day, you put a marble into a jar. Let's say you do it at midnight. Um, as time passes, you'd be putting more and more marbles into this jar. Um, and the number of marbles in the jar would increase. It would always be finite, but it would be increasing. And if time continued like that forever, there'd always be a finite number of marbles in the jar but that number would be in, uh, increasing forever, approaching infinity, but it would never actually get there, right? So the number exactly. of marbles in the jar would be a potential infinite. But then you've got to ask yourself, what is the number of the jar counting, right? It's counting the days that have been, right, at that point. At, at any point, if I look at the jar, and I, each one of them corresponds to a day that's in the past as of that moment, right? So what's increasing potentially, potentially infinitely, is the past, right, the future, or wherever I'm getting these marbles from, some big pile of marbles is in front of me. That's the future, it's not the marbles in the jar, right? It's the marbles I'm taking out of them. And if I can keep taking marbles forever and putting them in the jar, there has to be an infinite number of marbles in front of me, right? That's the future. Bill oh. talk about the marbles that are in the jar, right? But I think that, he, that he's just switching from the future tense to the future perfect tense when he does that. And it feels to me once you get your tenses in order, then that whole objection uh, it just it stops being a symmetry breaker. It's just it's effectively changing subject from from what the question was about. But I know we disagree about that. And yeah. <laughs> it would be nice to talk more about that. We could talk about that exact point, I think, for a couple of hours without really getting mm. much further with it. But I mean, I'm very interested to hear what your reply to that is, if you can spend a moment outlining what you think about that. I can say just one thing, and that is, I think your own illustration shows there will never be an infinite number of marbles in the jar. Um, that, but that, it, 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 I do not mean simply there will not have been, but there will not be an infinite number of marbles in the jar. So there, 
it, it is simply false that there will be an actually infinite number of events. It will always be finite. Well, okay, that's a number of events, uh, because as I said, each, each marble in the jar corresponds to a day that's passed. So, and I agree with you, the past will never be actually infinite. But we're talking about the future, right? The marbles I haven't put in the jar yet. There are no such marbles. Well, I mean, we're talking will... here, I remember, Temple Becoming is real. The marbles need to come into being. It's okay. not as though you've got a pile of future marbles. We're, we're talking about Temporal Becoming, right? Okay, so let's suppose the marbles pop into existence just before I drop them into the jar, right? Right. How many marbles will pop into existence, right? How many will pop into number. A potential well, infinite number, but there will never be uh, an infinite number of marbles that pop into existence. I, I still feel that's not right. The, the number of, if I ask how many, as of any time, how many marbles will I have put in the jar, then I agree with you, potentially infinite. But the ones that I will put in, how many will pop into existence that I'll put in the jar? If I never stop doing it, then I will put, you know, there is an infinite and actually infinite amount of marbles that will be put in the jar, even though there's no time. No, it. no, that, that's not is true. You, there will never be an infinite number of marbles that you put into the jar. Um, all you have here is a, a potential infinite increasing toward infinity as a limit, but the infinity is never instantiated ever. And it, it doesn't do any good to change to the past or the future perfect. The, the pure future is enough. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and move on. I think that what you can do, Alex, because you guys have a, a, a discussion planned after this, right? And so in the description of the video, once that video is up, I'm going to link to it. Do you, are you guys still planning on doing that? A future discussion? I haven't on heard of such a thing. No, I, this oh, okay. is news to me. Oh, okay. Um, well, we, we'll we'll see what we can do. If, if we can put a, together another discussion or if you guys want to organize one on on Alex's channel. E either way, I think it's time to move on. And uh, this has been super interesting already, but let's, if we can, let's move on to the second philosophical argument that, uh, that you present in your work, Dr. Craig. And uh, so just again, take about five minutes or so laying out the argument and then we'll get Alex's thoughts. Okay. Let's suppose that Alex is right and that an actually infinite number of things can exist. There's a second independent argument for the finitude of the past based upon the impossibility of forming an actual infinite by successive addition. It's important for your viewers to understand that in infinite set theory, um, there is no successive formation of infinite sets. All of the members of an infinite set are given simultaneously by the definition of membership. But there is no uh, account at all of adding members one after another to arrive at infinity. Um, and yet this is the way in which the past has been formed, adding one event after another to form the collection of events which are past at any point in the future. So the argument would go like this, an actually infinite collection of things cannot be formed by successive addition. Secondly, the series of past events in time uh, has been formed by successive addition, and therefore the series of events, uh, past events in time cannot be actually infinite. Um, and you can illustrate this, as medievals and others have done, with some very charming illustrations. For example, Al-Ghazali imagined Jupiter and Saturn orbiting the sun at different rates, so that every time um, Saturn goes around the sun once, Jupiter goes around twice. And if they've been, uh, if they orbit forever without an end, the discrepancy between the number of orbits completed by Jupiter and the number completed by Saturn will grow and grow. They will become increasingly divergent from each other. Indeed, they will approach a limit at which Jupiter is infinitely far behind, or Saturn is infinitely be uh, far behind Jupiter, sorry. Now, turn it around and ask, what would be the case if Saturn and Jupiter have been orbiting the sun from eternity? Which one will have completed the most orbits by today? 
Well, the answer mathematically is they're equal. They have both completed an actually infinite number of orbits. But this seems absurd because the longer they revolve about the sun, the greater the disparity comes becomes between them. So how in the world does this difference suddenly evaporate simply by making the number of um, or are making the series of uh, revolutions about the sun beginningless. It, it seems, again, crazy. Uh, and then Alex mentioned earlier the um, Grim Reaper paradox that Alexander Proust and Coons have uh, used. This is another illustration of the absurdity of forming an actual infinite by successive addition. In this story, we are to imagine that you are alive at midnight. But at 1 a.m., if you're still alive then, the Grim Reaper will swing his scythe and kill you. But then there's another Grim Reaper, number two, who will kill you at 12.30 uh, a.m. if you're still alive then. But then there's a third Grim Reaper at a quarter past 12 who will kill you if you're still alive then, and so on ad infinitum. Now, if an actually infinite number of things can be formed by successive addition, this leads to a contradiction. Um, namely, you cannot live past midnight, and yet you cannot be killed by any Grim Reaper, because before anyone could kill you, you would have already been killed. So this is an especially powerful version of the argument, because it shows not simply a metaphor, physical absurdity, but an actual logical contradiction. And again, these sorts of illustrations can be multiplied to show that uh, the idea of forming an actual infant collection of things by adding one member after another is a hopeless task. All right, Alex, where would you like to pick up here? Okay, so let's see. Which, by the I way, Alex, because you're yeah. talking through your phone, it's a little difficult to hear you. So, uh, sorry. If you if you can, just try to make sure that you're you're talking to her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, uh, let's see. So, with the revolutions of the planets, um, I I think it's a really good example for for bringing out the the weirdness of the uh, the infinite property we were talking about before, where if a cell collection is actually infinite, then you can show that there are proper parts that are sort of equivalent to the whole. Um, because, you know, just as Jupiter and Saturn have done the same number of orbits, um, it's kind of also true that um, Jupiter's only, uh, Saturn's only done half as many orbits as, as uh, Jupiter too, right? That, that you know, both of those hold in the same way that you can, you can kind of say, well, obviously there's only half as many even numbers as there are whole numbers. But there's kind of also the same number, right? The the, the notion of um, uh, of fewer than and equinumerous kind of break down when we're talking about infinite sets. Um, and I think that we kind of once you learn the rules of grammar of infinity, um, we just learn to sort of say that both of those things. Um, well, you can learn how how to speak about that. There are different ways of, of adopting terminology which make it seem much less problematic. I mean, like it's uh, it's just you can't expect fewer than an equinumerous to have the same meanings that they do um, uh, just for finite uh, collections. Now, I think there's something weird about trying to imagine uh, the transition from them having a finite number of orbits to suddenly being such that they have an infinite number of orbits each. And I think that's the interesting part of this. And it feels to me like the rubber meets the road um, there, right? So. The argument that interests me most that Bill makes is, is neither. I mean, we can talk about the Grim Reaper argument, but um, I, I'd like to beg off doing that because my my thinking around that's less clear, so it would be less helpful. Um, and I think it's much more technical. So I think it's I completely concede it's a very troubling argument um, and it's very difficult to, to um, understand. Uh, so let, I should let me, I should mention real quick, Alex. Some someone in the in the live chat just said that you've done an, an episode on this on your channel, on the Grim Reaper paradox. 
I did I did a discussion with somebody at, at one point. Yeah, and I have a couple of blog posts about that if people are interested to know what I think about that. Um, but and I, I should also mention that I've I've interviewed Rob Coons about it as well uh, on the Grim Reaper yeah. paradox. So that's available in our our, our archives if you want to search through our videos. Yeah, and I, I had an email exchange with with Cruz about that too. So um, anyway, I, it, it's a fascinating argument. But let me let me try and I because it seems to me that the, the rubber hits the road with the idea of transitioning from being in a finite state to being in an, in an infinite one, right? And and Bill brings that out really clearly in um, much many places in his writing by uh, highlighting the connection between the impossibility of forming an actual infinite through successive addition and the impossibility of counting to infinity, right? And this is obviously very closely related to what we were just talking about a moment ago. Um, it seems to me that the basic idea is, look, you can't count to infinity, right? Because um, Aleph naught, the kind of smallest number that's bigger than any finite number, right? So the smallest infinite mm -hmm. number, that doesn't have an immediate predecessor, right? But counting numbers is, it, it just is stating the immediate successor of the number you've just stated, right? So how could you ever, you, you know, if all you're doing is counting, you can't count any number that doesn't have an immediate predecessor, right? And because Aleph naught doesn't have an immediate predecessor, you're never going to count it no matter how long you count for, right? So and it, so here, here's here's a little thought experiment. Imagine imagine say Cameron is counting right. Starts counting now some arbitrary time t, um, and let's imagine that there's a time in the future that's more than finitely far away from now in the future right. That's per impossible right. Let's just imagine that that were the case, and that Cameron had been counting at a steady rate for the entire period between now and then right. Um, we could ask what number was Cameron counting at that point. Um, and it, it couldn't be a finite number, right? He must be counting some infinite number. Uh, but that means that hmm. he must have already counted a number that didn't have an immediate predecessor. And how could he do that, right? So it feels to me like what Bill's argument ex exposes is that time couldn't have that type of structure, right? There couldn't be a time that's so far in the future, right? Time couldn't run on so long that more than an infinite amount of time had elapsed between now and then, right? So. And I think that's fair enough. I mean, I'm quite happy to concede that, that you can't count to infinity in Bill's sense means that time has to uh, have a certain type of ordering, right? And it rules out there being uh, times that are more than finitely far away from any other moment. Right? And I think that, that that's perfectly reasonable. Um, I, I, it, to me, it's still, I still wonder though, whether, um, and I think we're gonna fall back into the same disagreement we had before, which is, I, I want to say something like Dretsky's argument, right? Which is that if Cameron starts counting now and never finishes, then for each natural number n, he will count that number. Um, and that holds for all of the natural numbers. So although he won't count a number that's more than finitely far away from zero, the quantity of numbers that he will count, right, the cardinality, is aleph naught, right? The, so if we think about aleph naught in terms of cardinality instead of ordinality, it does feel like that type of counting to infinity isn't ruled out purely by highlighting the impossibility of transitioning from the finite to the infinite. Now, that, I, I appreciate that that's somewhat technical, um, so, so some members of the audience might find that difficult to follow, but I, I'm sure that Bill's following me here, and I'd be very interested to know what he says about that. I think, Alex, that this is a modal operator fallacy that I have seen a number of times in your blogs. Uh, it is true that if the future is endless, that Cameron will be able to count every number in the future. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't follow from that that he will count all the numbers in the future. Um, and you, in your response to Jacobus Erasmus, seem to see this point that you that there's. It, it also emerges in the discussion of Andrew Lokes. Uh, example where uh, even though for any future hotel room God could instantiate that in the present, logically it doesn't follow from that that he could instantiate all the hotel rooms in the present. And in your response to Erasmus, um, you say it is you agree it is not possible for the now to traverse the interval between all the past events and now even though it can traverse 
the distance between any point in the past, every point in the past, and the now. I would put it a little better, I think, by saying it is not possible for the now to successively denote all past events ending in the present, even though it can designate every past event. Um, well, I so if it's possible, for, so if it's possible that Cameron counts to any M, right? Yes. Presumably it is. Um, why? I, I think I need a little bit more to explain why the inference is invalid to then rule that uh, he can count every natural number. You know, each. It just each doesn't number. follow. Uh, it it is it involves a modal operator shift that doesn't follow logically. Um, so can you explain uh, that one more? What do you mean by a modal operator shift? Well, it's possible to. Well, it, it, it has to do with the scope of the possibility or the necessity. Uh, and by shifting these, um, unconsciously, one can make invalid inferences. This is very easy to do. And I think that Alex recognizes this himself in his dialogue with Erasmus about the past. For any no, say, say we enumerate the past using the negative number series ending in zero, all right? Mm -hmm. Any number in that series is only a finite distance from the past. A present, sorry. Yep. Any number in the series is only a finite distance from the present, and therefore that can be traversed. But it doesn't follow from that that you can traverse all the numbers in the series. You see, there's a shift from every number in the series to all the numbers. And, and Alex recognizes this by saying to Erasmus, it's not possible for the now to traverse the whole series, even though it can traverse every part of it. Mm, it almost sounds like a composition fallacy. Yes, I think as the way I described it there, it is a fallacy of composition. Because every part of the past is traversable, does it follow that the whole past is traversable? No, that would be to commit the fallacy of composition. Yeah, okay, so it seems to me, I, so the difficulty, so that, that exchange with Erasmus, um, which I'm actually surprised you've read because I, to my mind that's not been published anywhere, so I, maybe maybe Jacob has shared that with you himself, but okay, fine. <laughs> I still agree with that, um, but let me try and explain uh, the, the way I see it now, right? Uh, the fallacy you're accusing me of would be like this, it seems to me. A, the the counterexample, right, a clear counterexample would be like this. Like, say, Cameron, I mean, your next kid that you have, if you have another child, um, it's true for any name that you could name them that name, right? So you could name them Bill or you could name them Alex or whatever, right? Um, but it's let's say it's not possible that you name them every name, right? Just because it's possible right, that you name right. them any name, it's not possible that you name them every name. Yeah. Could um, I interrupt... Could I interrupt just to give a, a different illustration? It's a classic one that I, I should have thought of before. Um, from the fact that um, every human being has a mother, it doesn't follow that there is a mother which every human being has. Yeah, okay, good. Do you hear the difference? From, from the fact that every human being is a mother, it doesn't follow that there is a mother which every human being has. That involves this scope confusion. Sure, but it's obviously not the case that every instance that follows that pattern is not truth-preserving. There are truth-preserving instances, right? So, um, I I can eat every uh, I can eat any loaf of bread, uh, any slice of bread in the loaf, um, and it follows that I can eat the whole loaf, right? Oh, it doesn't. Maybe it's too big a loaf, and you can't eat it all, Alex. <laughs> that that's a, a good but example. You can eat any slice, but not all of them. What I'm saying is, so for there are truth-preserving instances because, of course, I can eat the whole. I mean, I have a loaf. Just don't, don't make okay. me eat it in front of you now to prove this point. But like, you know, there are yeah. loaves where, right. where the first premise would be true and the conclusion would be true in that instance, right? Even though I grant you that it's not true universally, and okay. I think what my query is, I need a little bit more because for me, I'm still not seeing. So uh, let's go back to my actual example, which tr the the notion of traversal confuses me, right? The, the yes. notion of counting feels more straightforward, right? Yes. It feels like the, the, actually, in this case, it's more like the, the loaf of bread, right? just feels like, well, if 
it's true that Cameron will count it. Like, let's say, let's start off, say Cameron will, he starts counting now and no contingent impediment like falling asleep or going mad or anything befalls him. So he just keeps counting, right? And the future has no end to it. So it, as it were, Cameron will fill the future with his counting events. Now it feels like now, if that was true, right, I would be able to truly say now that Cameron will count, say, the number 10, that's true. He will count the number a million and 10, that's true. For any number, it's true that Cameron will count that number. Yes. And it feels to me that this is like the loaf of bread one, not like the uh, every human has a mother. And I want some. I want you to explain to me, uh, or the, well, obviously I grant that this inference isn't universally truth-preserving. I'm just not sure why it's wrong in this instance, right? And just sort of, sort of saying that sometimes this pattern of inference is not truth preserving doesn't really help me here it just yes. seems to me that this is one of those cases where it is truth preserving right and I'm, I'm not sure how how else to say it apart from to like obviously if he's going to count all of those numbers it's true that he will count all of the numbers right it just feels it, it feels obvious to me so uh -huh. so can you do something to explain to me why probably because you can't convert a potential infinite into an actual infinite by successive addition or by counting and that's why, as I say, set theory has been purged of all temporal notions. You have to just have the actual infinite given um, tenselessly by the definition of set membership. But you can't get there by successive addition. And this is well illustrated in Russell's Tristram Shandy story, where you remember Tristram Shandy writes his autobiography so slowly that it takes him a whole year to record the events of a single day of his life. And he worries that he'll never at this rate be able to write all his autobiography. And what Russell said was that if Tristram Shandy lives forever, then there is no page in the autobiography that will remain unwritten, but it doesn't follow that Tristram Shandy will therefore complete his autobiography. Uh, that would be to make that same fallacious quantifier shift or operator shift. So I, I, I guess I think, again, if this comes back down to the notion of converting a potential infinite into an actual infinite, I mean, I feel like we're now, we're having the same conversation we did a few moments ago, because it feels mm. to me like what's potentially infinite here is the future perfect version, right? Uh, if I say, how many numbers will Cameron count? Uh, sorry, how many numbers will Cameron have counted? Can you then tell me what future perfect means? I should have asked you that earlier. But, uh, will have, right? Like, um, it will have been the P as opposed to it will be the P. So it, the idea is that the temporal location that you're um, specifying is one that comes after P, but it's in the future. So let's say something like, uh, let's say, here's this glass of water, right? Now, um, to say I will have drunk this glass of water means that there's some time after the, the drinking of the water is finished. Right? And as of that time in the future, coming after the drinking, then it's, there's a past tense statement that's true, which says, I have drunk the glass of water. So you're saying there will be a point where it's true that there was a point where I drank the water. Right? So it's a kind of forwards and then looking backwards. Right? That's right. the future perfect. The future, the simple future tense, just looks forwards. It just says, I will drink the water. Right? Just saying, as of now, you know, that, that will happen at some point in the future. So it's the future perfect is sort of slightly more logically complex than the simple future, which is why it's called the simple future, because it's the most logically simple uh, tense. So I'm saying that Bill's tendency, I guess I guess I could come up with a name for this and call it a, some kind of fallacy. Um, I guess it's <laughs> a tense logical fallacy, but it seems to me that Bill's tendency is to fall into talking about things in terms of the future perfect tense. And obviously, he's not going to accept that this so. is my my analysis is correct, right? But it seems to me that that it, that it is anyway. Um, that Bill talks about future perfect um, situations. So, how many numbers will Cameron have counted? Um, it's always a finite number. And is it true that Cameron will have counted all of the numbers? No, it's not true. And I agree with that, right? And I think that 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 draws Bill into thinking. Well, it must it can't be true then that he will count all of the numbers. But I think that that's a fallacy, which I, I think you could call the simple to uh, simple to perfect inference, right? Which is like, if it's sorry, the, the yeah, the simple to perfect. So you would say something like, if it's true, how does it work? If it's true that I will 
count. If it's true that it will be the P, then it must be true that it will have been the P, right? The simple perfect implies the, uh, the simple future implies the future perfect. If it will be the P, then it will have been the P. And that's invalid, right? If that was valid, then you would be able to demonstrate from the fact that it never will be that Cameron has finished counting all of the infinite numbers, mm -hmm. that it never will be that he will count all of the infinite numbers, right? If that was valid, you could draw that inference. But the simple to perfect inference is invalid. And there are very, I mean, I can draw you a picture which shows you why sure. that's invalid as well. And then presumably you accept that that's an invalid inference. And right. In fact, I, I think that uh, there need not be any, any um, um, point in the future at which Cameron would look back and say, I have yeah, completed exactly. it. I mean, yeah. uh, when I say he will not count an actually infinite number of numbers, um, I'm not using the future perfect. I'm, I'm using the ordinary future tense. Um, because after all, you could just have that be the last moment of his life. He could cease to exist. So there would never be a future perfect. Um, afterwards, he could, that could be the point at which he stops. So I, I'm sticking with the simple future and just denying that it's true that there will be an actual infinite number of events in the endless future. Yeah, okay. Well, it's, I, I think maybe we should um, move to the very last thing I wanted to bring up because it feels to me like um, I think maybe we can discuss this in and maybe an email or something to to continue that because we can there must be more to this that we can uncover through uh more serious attention but i just feel like if if we keep talking about this now we're going to go around and around in circles because i'm going to keep saying the same thing and i think you will too and we'll both be unmoved by each other's replies hmm. let me try and move on to the last thing i wanted to bring up if we've got a few minutes cameron is that all right if we got yeah 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 we have about 14 minutes before we go to q a Okay, cool. oh. but the um, counting upwards to infinity, right? So the idea of Cameron starting counting now, um, and will he get to infinity, blah, blah, blah. In, in a sense, that's all preamble, right? Because it doesn't really matter yes. in the sense that what we're, what's really analogous would be can Cameron have counted down from infinity? Because that's what that's right. maps up the idea of the beginningless past. And here, um, I have some questions for Bill, but I think my thinking is less settled unless it turns out that it comes back to the simple future uh, future perfect thing again uh, let's hope not let's hope we can go somewhere new with this bill's got a um a type of objection here so so the, the idea would be you come across someone and they're going you know three two one zero few i've just finished counting all of the numbers in reverse from infinity in the past and then this is the point where i finished um and you know, this idea comes, I think, initially from Wittgenstein, who said something about somebody reciting the, the digits of pi backwards and how that would be uh, unreasonable to believe in any circumstance that that had happened. Um, and it's similar to the kind of absurdity objections we were talking about before. But I think Bill has, um, uh, well, he has something that it seems to me is either uh, a passage I don't understand, <laughs> which may well be true, or it's a passage which I think really contains two, uh, two distinct arguments one of which is an appeal to the principle of sufficient reason, which is to say something like, you know, there's just no explanation for how this person finished at this point rather than some other point. And then you could just say something like, there are no events that violate the principle of sufficient reason. This would be an event that violates the principle of sufficient reason. Therefore, this event is impossible. And you could run a little argument like that. Um, but there's another argument that Bill poses, which is something like this, which is to say, um, you know, if there's, imagine Cameron was finishing his countdown now, um, you know, then rewind the clock 10 minutes, he would have already had an infinite amount of time elapsed previously. And then Bill says things like, well, so he should have finished already by that point. Um, and, but then that's true also, of course, if we ran, we ran 10 minutes before that as well, and he should have finished by that point too. Um, and it, what this shows, I think, in this argument, unless I'm misunderstanding it, is that you can kind of keep saying that about earlier and earlier points. And that if, if the inference each time was that, Cameron should have finished by that point already. There's no point at which it's it's not true that he should have finished already, and that kind of means that he would never be counting at any point in the past because he could have he should have already finished at every point in the past. I mean that seems like it's a it's a different argument altogether because it's 
It's not saying, well, here's, a, here's the thing with no explanation. It's saying, here's a thing which is impossible because it would have already finished beforehand. Um, so it seems to me that those are two different arguments, yet Bill always talks about them in the same context. And I think different authors have understood what he says there in different ways. So I, I, it's a good opportunity for me to find out more about how you yes. think about that. Right. The argument is a dialectical one in which the uh, reasoning proceeds through various steps. So the initial um, puzzle is, how could anyone count down all the negative numbers ending at today? Uh, this seems like an absurd task, because before he could count any number, he would already have to have counted an infinite number of prior numbers. He just gets driven back and back into the past so that no number ever seems to get counted. So how could somebody finish his countdown today? That's the initial foray that one, one is asking. Now, in your dialogue with Erasmus again, you say we can cover an infinite interval just so long as we have an infinite amount of time. So you can count down all the negative numbers if you have, say, an infinite number of seconds. You can count one number per second. But then the question is, as I say, if that's a sufficient condition for finishing the countdown, then why didn't he finish his countdown yesterday or the day before that? By then, he'd already had an infinite amount of time to finish his countdown, and so he should already be done. In fact, no matter how far you regress into the past, at every point, he should have already finished because he's had an infinite amount of time to finish the countdown. But then it's not true that he has been counting from eternity, which contradicts the hypothesis. So that's a further problem with the argument. Now, suppose the objector says, well, there just is no reason why he finishes today rather than yesterday or the day before. Um, there, there is no explanation. Uh, the objector says, you're presupposing some version of the principle of sufficient reason that says there has to be a reason why he finishes today rather than yesterday. And in my response to Graham Oppie on this, what I argue is that I do not need to presuppose a radical principle of sufficient reason akin to Leibniz's, but a very modest version of the principle of sufficient reason, which would say that there needs to be an explanation for finishing the countdown uh, when he does, rather than at some earlier point. So that's the dialectic of the argument that features these different responses and counter responses. Uh, okay, so I, I think then that what you're saying is that there are distinct arguments there, which is helpful. Um, so, uh, right, so let, let me respond in this in this way. So first, let's divide into two chunks, right? So on the one hand, you're saying, um, and you quote me, actually, which is nice, uh, by saying that the, a sufficient condition on finishing the countdown would be that there's been an infinite number of counting events in the past. But it seems to me that if I said that in that paper, then I think that's wrong. It feels to me that it's a sufficient condition on the possibility of finishing a countdown now that there's yes. an infinite number of countdown events in the past. But of course, just because you've been counting, just because I've counted an infinite number of numbers in reverse, doesn't mean I'm counting zero now. I could be counting any number now. So, uh, you know, I could still, I could have only got as far as having 17 numbers left, right? And I, yes. I would have been counting forever. So <clears throat> obviously, so it seems to me that it's, um, it's not a sufficient condition of finishing now. It's a necessary right. condition of finishing now, right? If I've been counting forever, uh, sorry, if I'm finishing my countdown now, then I've been counting forever, that's true. But if I've been counting forever, then I'm finishing my countdown now, that's false, right? So it shows you the logical ordering of those. But if that's right, then I don't understand how, so go back to Cameron finishing his count now, what, what's the relevance of showing that 10 minutes ago he'd been counting an infinite number of numbers so he should have finished by then it doesn't feel right to me maybe he could have finished uh -huh. by then but it's wrong to say that he should have done that it seems like a modally too strong right yes and i'm not suggesting that you do think this is a sufficient condition but it, it seems to me that um if one says that he has had an infinite amount of time to finish his countdown then 
I don't know what more is needed in order to finish the countdown than an infinite amount of time and setting up a one-to-one -one correspondence between the moments of time and the numbers counted. Uh, the only way it seems to me to escape that would be by denying, as I say, the need for an explanation of when he finishes it. Um, and that would then get into right. the question of whether or not I can formulate and defend a modest version of the principle of sufficient reason that is plausible and that would demand that there be some reason why he finishes today rather than yesterday. Yeah, and in your reply to Oppie, you um, you say, well, Oppie likes uh, a version of the principle of sufficient reason. He says at least seems plausible uh, yeah. if there are you know some partial explanations for uh, contingent events, right? And it, I mean, now what's unfortunate is that the notion of partiality that's in play here. I'm not quite clear what that's supposed to mean, but one way of thinking about it is that you know the kind of Van Ingwagen modal collapse argument shows everybody that really super strong versions of explanation um, are too strong. And if, if the principle of sufficient reason was like that, then we'd get modal collapse or uh, there'd, there'd have to be some unexplained contingent fact. So generally a partial explanation, I think is supposed to be something weaker than uh, an explanation that logically entails the thing that it explains in order to get around this modal collapse thing. So if you mean I mean, I, it's not quite clear. I think Proust means by uh, a partial explanation something which sort of displaces uh, at least some of the mystery to something else. So I think an example of that might be, you know, why was, let's, let's see, let's take a proposition, Bobby Kennedy is dead, right? And then the partial explanation of that is that he was shot, right? That's, that's why he's dead, right? That explains it to some extent. But of course, it doesn't remove all of the mystery about it because you can say, well, why was he shot, right? And then you can, uh -huh. well, Sirhan Sirhan shot him, right? And then you might say, well, okay, but why did Sirhan Sirhan shoot him? And then we might find, well, I don't know why he shot him, right? Sirhan Sirhan's motives are completely opaque and difficult to understand. So that's my explanatory chain basically goes as far as a mystery about why Sirhan Sirhan did what he did. But it feels to me that uh, that's, that doesn't undermine whatever explanatory value, the partial explanatory value that we got from saying that the reason that Bobby Kennedy is dead is because he was shot, right? That still does explain, right. at least partially, right? Displaces some of the mystery, puts it on something else. Well, if that's the type of explanation that you're asking for with the countdown event, feels like I can give those types of stories for it, right? Like I could say, well, why, why, did, why did Cameron finish counting down now? Well, because 10 minutes ago, he had 10 numbers to count and he counts at the rate of one number per minute. I mean, it doesn't explain everything. <laughs> But what, yeah, you know, that just kicks the can down the road, I think. Yeah, but I, isn't that yeah. the nature of a partial explanation, though, if it just sort of partially displaces the mystery? I mean, I just wonder what you're asking for in, an, in a partial explanation. If that well, happens. I'd have to refer you to my article in response to Oppie, where he uh, lays out a very modest version of the principle of sufficient reason that seems to me to be plausible uh, and defensible. But when you apply it to the case of the man finishing his countdown, it turns out that principle is violated by such a scenario. But uh, the so, well, I guess, is an explanation that seems to satisfy that version of the PSR. It's a partial explanation, uh, unless that's not what you mean by partial explanation. Well, I'd have to, again, refer folks to the original article, which is a reply to Api, and I, um, I do not have memorized his uh, version of the principle, it just seemed to me that it was both modest and defensible, but that it would be violated by the man finishing his countdown at one point rather than another. Uh, there should be an explanation based on this principle, but there isn't one. I think this is actually a good time to switch to Q&A. Are you guys okay with that? Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead and transition and and Bill, do you have do you have the name of that paper that you responded you know, to Oppie? Uh, I don't, but I can tell you where it is. Um, the, yeah, just Topan, for for anyone who's interested in looking for. Paul Topan it. has edited a, a really uh, nice two volume collection on the Kalam cosmological argument, and the first volume is on the philosophical arguments for the beginning of the universe. The second volume is on the scientific 
evidence for the beginning of the universe. And the first volume produces in it the papers by Wes Morriston, Graham Oppie, um, and many other of the critics that we've talked about today, as well as responses from people like David Oderberg, myself, uh, and others. So that can be found in that collection called The Kalam Cosmological Argument, edited by Paul Copan. All right, Alex, is there anything else to add before we, before we move on? The name of that paper is uh, the ingeniously titled Graham Oppie on the Kalam Cosmological Argument. <laughs> <laughs> Your memory is better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move on to questions. All right, this one is from Andrew Hinson. He asked this earlier on, and it was through a super chat, so thank you for that, Hinson, or Andrew. He says, my question, calculus shows us that the limit of X as it approaches infinity is infinity, but does this not then show that there must be an infinite gap between the value of X and infinity itself? I'm happy to repeat that. And wh whom is this directed toward? This one is not directed to anyone in particular. Well, I think it's important to understand that in analysis, the notion of a potential infinite is not a number. Aleph null in set theory and transfinite arithmetic is a number. It is a cardinal number. But the idea of a potential infinite is not a number. It's a limit concept, which you approach endlessly, but you never actually arrive at. So his question is just malposed. Their, their analysis doesn't deal with the number of elements that lie between the limit and the number that you're feeding into the function. Any thoughts, Alex? Um, yeah, I, so there's this famous letter of Cantor to, I think, uh, Dedekind, where he talks about the, um, he makes this argument where he says, I mean, this is too long to explain properly, but I'm, I'm just going to highlight it briefly. It, it, so the idea is that um, if you have variable magnitude that can take any range, any any uh, value, um, like uh, if you have a variable X and you can say it can take any real number or any natural number as, a value, as its value, then you've got to think of the range of values that it can take. Um, and although uh, it's it's reasonable to consider the variable itself as a potential infinite, something that can sort of slide along this scale as far as you like uh, in one direction, if you consider the range, which would be all of the values that it can take, the kind of scale along which it's sliding, that has to be actually infinite, says Cantor, for the, for the variable to be slidable infinitely in this direction. Um, I think he changed his mind about that. But anyway, he made this argument. Um, and it seems to me that maybe there's something about that that's going on here. I, I feel like the questioner is trying to ask about the the quantity in the range that the mm. variable is uh, allowed to take values from or something. And I mean, it's very difficult to explain. I, I, and I think I'm probably butchering the argument to some extent. I'd need to sit down and say it more carefully to, to, to get the nuance there. But I, I, maybe I can see where it's coming from. Okay, so the next question, this is probably the most serious question we're going to address today from Nathan Orman. He says, for Alex, can he eat a whole loaf in front of us? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so this one is for Dr. Craig He's from Cranman Phono Cinema. He's our videographer. Dr. Craig, I don't oh. think you actually met him. I had a, a, a different guy last time when we were doing our in-person interview, which, by the way, I've linked in the description of the video. We did an in-person interview with Dr. Craig on the atonement. So if you want to watch that, check out the description. He says, this is John Cranman. Dr. Craig, can you offer a few brief arguments against the B theory of time? By the way, Christianity is true, everyone. Oh. <laughs> um, I thought that Alex might bring up the tenseless theory of time today, though he, he didn't defend it. Um, but I've tried to do my philosophical duty with respect to the tensed theory of time. So I've written two books that deal with this. The first one is called The Tensed Theory of Time, a, uh, a Critical Examination. And then the second one is called The Tenseless Theory of Time, a Critical Examination. Both of these published by Kluwer, academic press. And in these books, 
I examined the arguments in support of the tensed theory and against the tensed theory, and then the arguments in support of the tenseless theory and the arguments uh, against the tenseless theory. Now, the question he asked, I think, was arguments, did, you, did he say against the tenseless theory? Correct. Yeah. Um, I, I refer to the book, The Tenseless Theory of Time, but one of them, for example, is that the tenseless theory of time implies a view of personal identity over time that seems to be quite objectionable. On a tense theory of time, three-dimensional objects endure through time. But on a tenseless theory, three-dimensional objects are merely time slices or stages uh, or temporal parts of four-dimensional objects, which are extended throughout time. And um, this, I think, makes nonsense of personal identity over time, since these stages are not identical with one another, which means that no stage ever endures from one moment to another. The Alex that we're looking at on the screen now is not the same Alex that we were looking at on the screen when we started this interview. This makes moral play, praise and blame impossible because the person who is punished or praised is not the same person as the person who did the crime or commendable act. Unless you say that persons are the whole four-dimensional object, in which case persons are not self-conscious individuals endowed with freedom of the will and rationality. So the problems involved with perdurance as opposed to endurance, I think, are a major deficit of the tenseless theory of time. That's just one of them. Okay. Yeah. If you want more, then check out his book. Someone in the live chat just recommend or just suggested, Dr. Craig, that we do a uh, an interview just going through all of the books that you've written and taking a, a few minutes to, to explain them. That might actually be fun. All right. Next one. Next question is from John DeRosa. He says, and this is another super chat. So thank you, John. He says, what do you mean by actually infinite? And do you agree with each other on this definition? Do you want to take that, Alex? Well, OK, sure. Uh, I am happy to follow Bill's lead on what he uses the term to mean. Um, well, so I take it that that the idea is, um, I mean, I, I have I have um, I have a philosophy of mathematics friends who th think I um, I may be using the word incorrectly, but I think that there's different pockets of the dialectic where different communities using the word in slightly different ways. But I take it that Bill's usage here is that any quantity or collection that has Cantor's property is actually yes. right. And and yeah, so uh, there are people in philosophy of mathematics so who will say only actualists think that, right? Potentialists. Um, don't think that they would think that in addition to having that it has to be true that all of the um proper all of the things that we're talking about can exist together in, in the same oh, the same sense or whatever so you find potentialists will say that the natural numbers are not actually infinite anyway but we, we oh sorry about that i, I think i'm an, an actualist by intuition anyway so that means that i agree with bill there um, so there's, but there is a debate. I mean, there's there's a hideous amount of nuance with with how these things work. I think just for the purposes of this discussion, I mean, in this piece of the literature, um, actually infinite just means has Cantor's property of being able to line up proper parts and show that they're equivalent to the whole, uh, and that's more or less all there is all there is to it. Yes. All right. Let's move on to the next question, and this one is another super chat from Maverick Christian. Thank you so much. He says, for Malpass and Proust's 2009 Grim Reaper slash Hilbert's Hotel deductive argument, a brief argument, at, and he gives a, a link to it, which premise do you reject and what is your response to the justification of said premise? I'm not sure if you're I do, yeah, familiar so, with the exact, okay. Not a publication, um, and I, I know the argument because it's similar to Loke's uh, argument. In fact, it's a very similar um, argument altogether, but with a Grim Reaper twist to it. Um, and I, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember what the numbers of the premises or whatnot. Um, I, I think, if if I'm remembering it rightly, that it involves the notion of um, accumulating things over an infinite time. And if anyone's interested in the response to that type of argument, 
uh, then I refer you to the final section in the paper that Wes and I published the other day, which I guess Cameron is linking to, where I set out what I think is the fallacy with that. If you're just asking about the Grim Reaper argument in general, um, I don't have a killer knockdown objection to it, right? Um, what I'm interested in doing at the moment is seeing how you can temporally mirror arguments that show that the universe had a beginning. Um, and the Grim Reaper argument is one of the more interesting ones to do that with. So Cohen has this nice argument about mirroring a bunch of arguments for the beginning of, of, of time. And he has a version of mirroring the Grim Reaper argument to show that it must also imply that the, that the future has an end. Um, and I've developed that to some extent, uh, but I won't go into the detail now because it will take me about 10 minutes to get mm. to explain the idea properly. And I'm not 100% sure whether it has any merits or not. It might be, it might be a dead end. So yeah. I'll spare the audience the, the unnecessary detail. Perhaps at this point, I might refer our audience to Alexander Proust's brand new book, which is called uh, Causation, Paradox and Infinity. This is, I think, the most brilliant book on the Kalam cosmological argument ever written. It just came out last year, and it is um, really a tour de force. And what's especially significant about Proust's argument is that it breaks, or it avoids, rather, the parallelism between past and future that Alex alleges against my formulation of the argument. Proust's argument is that no event can be the effect of an in infinite number of causes. No event can be the effect of an infinite number of causes. That rules out an infinite beginningless past series of causes, but it obviously doesn't rule out a uh, forward uh, series of causes on into the future. So Proust calls his view causal finitism, as opposed to full finitism. And so if you are troubled by this uh, argument about parallelism of past and future, Bruce's causal finitism is always um, an option for you. And it is kind of the breaking stuff in philosophy, or uh, that's a terrible way of phrasing that. But it's it's groundbreaking work. It's new stuff. It's really cool. I have the book as well. I haven't written, uh, I haven't read through the whole thing, but it's great what I've what I've read so far. So, just wanted to uh, to emphasize that. So we have uh, a few more questions that are already lined up. If you guys want to ask a question, make sure to to say who you're addressing your question to, but also make sure to tag at cap at capturing Christianity in the live chat, so that way I can make sure to see your question. Last thing I wanted to to say to everyone is, if you're watching this, you've enjoyed the show hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel and turn on notifications so you can get notifications when we post new videos. And thank you for doing that in advance. So here is the next question from Vanadime. And a few people have asked this, and so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just, just get it out here. This one is for you, Dr. Craig. He says, would, would you or would he be keen to debate Graham Oppie at some point, perhaps in this format on capturing Christianity? Um, wow. I, I don't see how I could refuse. Um I think when you have credible, credentialed uh, opponents like Alex Malpass, then yes, it's it's obligatory to engage with one's critics. And so while I've uh, often declined to debate popularizers um, with bona fide scholars like Malpass and Oppie, uh, I think that this is something that uh, I have to do. Well, cool. Then I'll reach out to uh, to Graham and we'll see if we can put something together. That's great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one is from Mordek 101. And this one is another one for Dr. Craig. He says his argument that eternal causes lead to temporal effect equals personal. I'm not sure how, how he's uh, he's trying to phrase this. He's also working within the confines of the character limit that's set by YouTube. He says with a probability, if cause is timeless, must the effect still be temporal probably won't out up over time so i'm not sure if that's coming through if that's uh very yeah, it, it's not a coherent question what it's related to is what you said cameron in your introduction that having arrived at the conclusion that a cause of the universe exists i then tried to deduce some of the properties that it must have and a number of theologically striking properties emerge 
And one will concern the temporal relation of this cause to the um, series of events. And uh, I worked on this for 11 years full time, the, the question of the nature of time and temporal becoming. And the position that I came to was that the cause of the universe is timeless, sans creation, but temporal since the moment of creation. It's a strange hybrid view, but uh, so far as I can see, it's coherent, um, and I think it's the most plausible view. Okay, so here's another super chat from Stryker Knight. He says, William Lane Craig, do you have an objective moral duty to be so decisively intelligent yet charming and cordial. Thank you for all you do. Oh, I thought he was going to say I wasn't charming and cordial. This this uh, does jog my memory, though, about something Alex said. I don't think the moral argument, Alex, is an indirect ad hominem argument in the way that your objection is. In the moral argument, it is true. I've argued with objectivists like Eric Wielenberg to say, hey, what is the best explanation for the moral values we both hold dear and, and adhere to? But I'm also happy to debate against moral nihilists and to defend the truth of the second premise that objective moral values and duties exist. So it's not ad hominem, it's not aimed at people who believe in objective moral values and duties, but don't recognize their ground in God. No, I'm, I'm willing to... Um, uh, defend the argument against all um, comers. All right, so we have a question for Alex now. This one is another super chat from In Dirish. Alex, do you feel that the objections you raise today are the strongest arguments you could raise against the beginning of the universe? Um, I don't think that there... So my inclination is to think that the are the objections that are the most plausible are the ones that disarm the arguments for the beginning of the universe rather than argue against the beginning. It's not like I have a positive argument that there was no beginning to the universe. Um, I'm not a an infinite pastor or something. Uh, I'm I'm merely skeptical of the uh, I don't know veracity or whatever of the arguments that try and established that it had a beginning and and you can dismantle an argument which reaches a conclusion um without showing that the conclusion it was arguing for is false so uh, th that's my position here it's more of skeptical um you know in a, in a way cliche douchebag atheist guy is the one who's been <laughs> not offering a positive argument but just merely critiquing the, the christian's positive argument i guess that's that's what's happening here but you know yeah, I, I don't have an argument that the that the universe doesn't have a beginning, and I, I'm not sure there are any particularly plausible ones. I mean, Aristotle has one that seems laughably bad. So, and uh, Kant's sure argument in the thesis of his first antinomy, I think, is also just horrible okay. yeah, for right. uh, the beginninglessness of the past. Okay, right. we're gonna yeah. sorry, we're yeah, gonna right. pick back up on one of the questions that we got from Wade. Tis Tamara, I actually have the link pulled up here. And so he's really curious, uh, Alex, what your thoughts are on this argument from, from Alexander Proust. He says, this is premise one. If there could be a backwards infinite sequence of events, Hilbert's hotel would be possible. That's premise one. And this is all very relevant to the discussion today. Premise two, if Hilbert's hotel were possible, the Grim Reaper paradox could happen. Premise three... Okay. Premise three, the Grim Reaper paradox cannot happen, and then the conclusion, therefore, there cannot be a backwards infinite sequence of events. Yeah, and then in, in the blurb underneath uh, that statement, he gives a sort of supporting argument for premise one, right, where he says, if there could be a backwards infinite sequence of events, there could be a backward, backwards infinite sequence of events during which a hotel room is created and none is destroyed. An infinite uh, number of hotel rooms would then be the result. Um, and that's so premise one is the one I'm uh, arguing against there then if he wants a number and I would suggest that he reads section I guess six or seven of the paper seven uh, which addresses that precisely so um, rather than well the basic way of putting it was something like this right I mean let's assume creation ex nihilo is possible 
at all, I guess, uh, if it is. Um, and then you've got to wonder how many hotel rooms is it possible that could be created at any one time, right? So, I mean, let's personalize it. If God can create hotel rooms ex nihilo, um, how many can he create at any one time? Um, his omnipotence surely doesn't extend so far that he could create infinitely many hotel rooms all in one go. Otherwise, uh, that means that God's existence would entail the possibility of a Hilbert's hotel, right? So God's omnipotence, and surely he can make one hotel room or two or three, blah, 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 but he can't make infinitely many. So it must be that God's omnipotence is limited, at least, to making only finitely many hotel rooms at any one time, uh, lest an infinite hotel be possible following from God's existence. Um, and I think once you put that restriction, and you can think of it as a restriction on God's omnipotence, how we put it in the paper, but, you know, it doesn't have to be about God. You can think of it as a restriction on the um, possibilities of what can be created ex nihilo in any one moment. Um, and if we're putting a finitist restriction on that, um, it turns out, when you think about it carefully, that um, it, it, it then doesn't follow that just because there's an infinite number of past times uh, that a Hilbert's Hotel uh, is possible. Um, but I refer away to the um, paper because I spent more time going through that more carefully. Um, and it's peer reviewed and it's in a good journal. So it's better than um, me saying it off the top of my head and maybe getting it wrong. I don't know, if, Bill, you read that section and maybe you have a crushing objection to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did read it. Um, and I want to just say that the point that we're talking about now is related to the last three points of response that I had to your critique, which are that there are reformulations of the argument that don't require the sort of symmetry breaking move that I myself defend. And these would be versions by Landon Hedrick, by Andrew Loke, and then by Alexander Proust. So I just want to draw our viewers' attention to these various uh, different formulations uh, of the argument to which the objection based on the symmetry of past and future are inapplicable. All right, so let's move on. Uh, Landon just got a paper published. I, I, he's a friend of mine. We spent a few hours talking yes. the other night. And he has a new paper coming out, uh, just published in, um, uh, in the Religious Studies, I think. And uh -huh. I, great, I, I read, I've read it. So um, you, in particular, Bill, you should go and read that. Yes, it sounds like there's a good ongoing debate, which is just terrific. All right, next question. This one is another super chat from Dan Philpot. He says, Craig, say that I count infinitely many X's if for any natural number in, I count in X's. If I count indefinitely, is it not true that I will count past any in and so count infinitely many X's? Oh no, that's obviously wrong. You, you, if you're counting natural numbers n, then you will just count limitless. I mean, not limitlessly, endlessly, toward infinity as a limit. But you'll you'll never get there. You just will count for every finite natural number. You will count that number, but you'll never count all the numbers or arrive at infinity. That's the very nature of the the potential infinite, as Alex said. Okay, so, so we have... Just very briefly, then. I, Go for that it. That sounds to me like an, uh, another version of um, Bill making the same move, it seems to me. It's again... So the, the way that you put it then was, uh, you know, that you'd count, um, however it was, to, to any n, uh, but you, you're never going to get there, get to infinity. But it makes me think that what you're saying is, you're never going to get to the point where it's done and you're like, oh, that's over now. And then like looking back, oh, that's done. You're never going to get are, to that point. And I agree with that. But then, you know, that's not what we're asking. It's it's just whether you will count each of them. You know, is each of them such that you will count it? And no, you're so saying it's, much it's, more than that. You're you're saying much more than that, Alex. You are saying much more than you, you will count each of them because that's not in dispute. Um, just as in an infinite past, each number is a finite distance from the present. This is part of the bizarre and fascinating nature of the infinite, is that in an infinite series of events, every event in the series is only a finite remove from the, the present or the end. 
And you would think, well, if everyone is only finite, then the whole thing must be finite. But that's not the way it works with infinity. You, you can't logically make that kind of inference. And as I say, I think this comes up again and again in your blogs and, and articles, Alex, is this illicit move from every to all. Yeah, and, and I think that it's, it's I, I don't know, I, I don't think that it's illicit. I think that, uh, that and so we, we, we basically have a, an impasse here that uh, I, I disagree with you on your analysis of whether I'm making a mistake here. I think you're making a mistake and you disagree with me about whether I'm right in thinking that you're making a mistake. So it would, I think we have to maybe talk more about, about this because it might be that I'll change my mind. Um, but uh, you know, at the moment, I'm not, I, I haven't been persuaded by anything you've said that what I'm doing is actually an instance of the uh -huh. fallacy you're suggesting. Uh, I, need, I need the counter model actually drawn out for me before I'm going to be able to accept All right. that. All right, we're about to run out of time here, so let's get on to uh, just a couple more questions and then we'll close it out. So this one is another one from our videographer, Cranman, which, by the way, he did a short film recently called The Promise, which has won a few awards. It's a really, really excellent short film. I recommend, highly recommend that you go check it out. I don't have any links to it. I can actually put a, a link to it in the comments. So if you want to check it out, uh, do so. It's, it's really, really cool. He says, Alex, what would it take for you to be a theist? What arguments do you find most compelling? And then a question for Dr. Craig. He says, will you endorse Cameron's show now? <laughs> So you go first, because it's probably an easier one for you. Yes, I, I hereby endorse Cameron Bertuzzi's program. I think he has on very fine guests uh, um, and very interesting discussions. Uh, I think he's doing a terrific job, and so I commend it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Uh, so the question was, what would make me become a theist? What um, arguments do you find most compelling? So those are two questions. I think I don't know. Yeah, those are different. I don't know what would do it, but I, yeah, it's difficult to predict in advance what's going to change your mind. I'm um, not a huge fan of those these types of questions, just to be honest, and I don't think that Bill is either. Is that right? I don't know. Um, these types of like what I think would it's convince fair to ask, you? Which arguments do you find most persuasive? I think that's fair. That's not a personal question the other one is rather personal yeah i mean the, the, the problem with the first one is it's like saying what would make you fall in love with me or something it's like you know it just happens when it happens right like mm -hmm. it's some, to some extent it's out of your control and um it's only looking back on it that you can make sense of that and you, you can't really predict it in advance or classify it or systematize that anyway um so i guess what would what would make me believe in theism would be uh, an argument that I found persuasive, right? <laughs> that, that's not helpful. Um, oh. So which arguments do I think are most, I think that um, I have to say the Grim Reaper argument is the one I find the, the one that I find hardest to put to bed in my own mind. You know, I, I, I sometimes I, I will consider an argument. It seems uh, new and interesting and the contours of it need to be gone over. And then after a while I can sort of, rest easy enough with my understanding of it and the grim reaper I always find it difficult to put it, put it down you know i keep coming back to it um and i don't feel like i've really i feel like I, there's still more i need to do on that so i'm not sure if it means that it's most persuasive but i think it's the hardest sudoku puzzle to solve that i've come across so far that's where i would look at it all right last question from elliot hopkins he says to both of you what would you say to those who affirm the compatibility of a tenseless theory of time and the universe having a beginning. We'll start with... Well, I think the, it certainly is compatible, and there are a good many physicists today who, on the basis of the astrophysical evidence, would affirm that space-time has a boundary in the earlier-than direction. Now, whether it has a boundary in the later-than direction will depend upon things like its expansion speed. And the best evidence is that the universe will go on expanding forever and will not recontract, in which case the series of events beginning at the initial cosmological singularity, if there was such a thing, is going to be potentially infinite. All right, we'll get a quick response from Alex, and then uh, we'll move to some closing statements and then close out the stream. Sorry, can you pose the question again? It, I, I got yep. distracted by... Yep, message. no worries. He says, uh, what would you say to those who affirm the compatibility of a tenseless theory of time 
and the universe having a beginning? Oh, I see. Uh, well, uh, broad, broad question of logical compatibility. It just is logically compatible. There's not much else to say about it from that point of view. I have my logician's hat on. I don't know enough about physics to say any of those types of things. But um, for, for as you know, tense logician, which is what I was professionally, um, I there's there's just no reason to think that they're not compatible. Um, Fair enough. All right. Well, let's move into closing statements. And I also wanted to mention that if you guys uh, want to support the show, want to support Capturing Christianity, you can do that at patreon.com slash Capturing Christianity. We're actually in the middle of launching a Spanish YouTube channel where we're transcribing mm. some of our videos into Spanish. We have some voice actors that we're working with to overdub the uh, the audio so it's not just transcription at the bottom of the screen or anything so uh so yeah that's what we're working on currently if you want to support patreon.com slash capturing christianity well let's start with you dr craig give uh take about 60 seconds if you can and summarize your thoughts so far uh, or, or thoughts of the discussion and then we'll move to alex and close it out all right um i hadn't uh, thought about a closing statement so let me just do this off the cuff <laughs> It seems to me that the Kalam cosmological argument for a personal creator of the universe is one of the most powerfully supported theistic arguments. The first premise that whatever begins to exist has a cause seems to me virtually undeniable for any intellectually honest inquirer. The second premise that the universe began to exist is supported not only by the two philosophical arguments that we've discussed today, but also by stunning uh, astrophysical uh, confirmations both from the expansion of the universe and from the large-scale thermodynamic properties of the universe which indicates that the universe is finite in the past uh, and had a beginning and uh, this yields you then a cause of the universe which is beyond space and time enormously powerful and immaterial uh, which brought the universe into being and I think this also requires credibly that this cause be personal, so that you get a personal, causeless, spaceless, timeless, immaterial, enormously powerful creator of the universe out of this argument, which is, I think, the core concept of God. All right, Alex. Um, okay, so I think fundamentally Craig and I disagree on something to do with this tense uh, inference between the future uh, and future perfect tense. And sorry, Bill, did you want to go back and say something about that? No, only the importance of the tensed theory of time for the Kalam cosmological argument, I think, can't be overstated. Sure. Go okay, ahead. good. So, right, right, right. I mean, and, and so, well, you know, in, in some respects, the, the tense theory of time is, uh, although Bill's obviously done a lot to present a passionate defense of that theory it's still somewhat controversial it's not like a consensus view amongst philosophers um there's a lot of dissenting views among philosophers there and i guess if you had to count people's views you'd probably find more people would be theoretic or confused rather than committed atheists um make make of that what you will um so, so it feels to me like there's a lot of things you have to buy to get to the end of the conclusion um, that I find problematic. Um, and anyway, so in our particular disagreement, it feels like comes down to something very difficult to, um, that it may have been some part of talking past one another here. Um, and it would be nice to be able to reach um, a moment of communication over this that might take longer than a two hour conversation where we're able to understand one another's positions more clearly because I think that to some extent um, Craig's baffled by my uh, my uh, view and I think that um, I, I'm equally baffled by his in reply so that that, that, that I think indicates um, I, maybe that I'm a complete idiot that that's, that's certainly possible <laughs> or, or that there's um, a communicative barrier there that, that still needs to be worked through to some extent um, but in, until we do I, I, I'm not sure that I've got the type of resolution or the kind of a adequate rebuttal to the point that I was bringing up earlier. And, and with the rest of the stuff, I'm still making my mind up about it. So I'm, I'm very happy for, for Bill to set me straight if I, if I go wrong. Um, and I might show him a draft of a new paper um, as it's, it's mainly focused on the second part of the argument too. He might have a crushing rebuttal 
that will destroy the whole project, but hopefully not. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll see. That's not much of a closing statement. I'm not very good at closing statements or opening statements, really. I'll <laughs> stop talking. I have to stop at some point. <laughs> Well, I appreciate both of you guys taking the time to do this. I know that we're the with the whole virus situation, it's sort of given us the opportunity to even have something like this. But I appreciate you either way putting the uh, the time aside to to do this. So thank you. Thank you. Good to do it. All right, we have a few more live discussions and interviews and everything coming up. So if you want to get more updates on everything that's happening on the YouTube channel coming up. Like on Thursday, I'm interviewing a guy on the hallucination hypothesis. He's actually a medical doctor who has written a paper on this and and uh, thinks it's the it's a very, very bad argument. There's a whole bunch of cool things coming up on the channel. So check the homepage on YouTube of Capturing Christianity so you can get more information there. And so next time, we'll see you guys later. So thank you so much for tuning in.